Good, e good evening, everybody. My name is Michael Freeston. I'm Director of Quality Improvement at the Early Years Alliance, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this Strong Early Years London webinar, um, focusing on the Early Years Policy and Practice Update, trying to give people an opportunity to get their heads around the various initiatives from the Treasury, uh, and also just an update on where we are with Ofsted since the restart of inspections back in May, and also the new early years inspe uh, inspections against the new early years, um, early years foundation stage framework from September. I'm delighted you're with us this evening, and I'm joined by my colleagues, um, Shannon Pite, communica Communications and External Affairs Director. Can you say hello, Shannon, please? Just hello. Me... Sorry, Michael, I've got a bit of a delay on your audio. Oh, OK. Uh, this is going to be interesting all day then. Oh, um, and also Melanie Pilcher, Quality and Standards Manager at the Alliance. <laughs> Melanie wins today's prize of having her machine freeze. Are we still on mute, Melanie? Right. OK, we know she's there. Um, and also, fortunately, Melanie's doing the second part of today's presentation. <laughs> Are you with it, us, Melanie? It's working. Hello, everybody. Um, fingers crossed we, we'll hold it together until the end of the session. Right. Uh, can I suggest you don't go on to mute again, Melanie, just in case that we never get you back again? Michael, okay. you've never said that to me before in 15 uh, th years. That's a fairly good point. Yes, thank you. Right. Um, uh, my role uh, is chair of the session, so I would invite people to make any questions, comments into the chat function. Um, and I will then seamlessly feed them in to um, Sharon, Shannon and Melanie as they're going through, or maybe not so seamlessly and just interrupt. And it also means that I get the pleasure of pressing the buttons to take us onto new, new slides. And so Chris would like, they'll just ask me to, um, to just move on. Right, just a couple of seconds, uh, just for those of you who are new to our webinars, I'll give you a brief introduction to the Strong Early Years London programme. It's been commissioned by the Mayor of London. It's a 10 month programme running between May of this year into March of 2022 um, and looks to identify and support um, the business needs of early years preschools, nurseries, childminders in London um, with a series of advice, briefing sessions, uh, virtual classrooms, um, but also uh, I'll say a bit more as we go through today's session on one-to-one -one consultancy and support that we're now in a position to offer. Uh, we're working in partnership with a range of other organizations. It's not just delivered by the Early Years Alliance uh, and also in collaboration with all two, 32 London boroughs. Uh, we have a broad range of topics where we feel that across the partnership, we're able to give support. Um, all of these slides will be sent to everybody who's registered for this session. So don't please frantically try and write everything down. We'll circulate them tomorrow along with evaluation forms. And also this session is being recorded and so will be made available um, on the uh, Early Years Alliance's YouTube page via uh, a website, which I'll talk to you about more as we just run through today. Um, the website, uh, provides up-to-date information. It's located on the London Business Hub and includes a searchable directory of support that individuals may wish to find in their local area or available across London through the programme. Uh, we've run monthly webinars, uh, of which obviously this is the November one, and as well as what we call Business Connect training sessions, um, looking at a range of those business topics. One for tomorrow, for example, is looking at how um, apprentices could be very valuable to um, the addition of your staff workforce. Um, and if you'd like more information about that, there is information that will come at the end. We're also offering group surgeries in collaboration with each of the local authorities. And there is a helpline if you want to find out more information and how we can be of support to you. And again, that number will be included on the slides when you get them. Right, that's enough from me. Um, just the aims of the session is to present an overview of the recent funding and policy announcements from Treasury DfE and consider their implications for the sector and particularly providers in London, um, but also and also to consider the recent changes from Ofsted, new documentation and trends that are coming up in published reports. Without further ado, over to Shannon. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, good evening, everyone. 
So I'm going to talk today about some of the government announcements that have come out recently and the impact that they are likely to have on providers in the capital. Um, one of the main things that's happened in recent months is the uh, 2021 spending review. So the spending review is a process the government goes through normally every three years. There was a, a one year spending review last year due to the pandemic, but normally every three years where essentially the various government departments make their argument to the Treasury as to how much money they need for the next three years. And then the Chancellor, Rishi Sunak, tells them how much money they're actually getting. And there were a few announcements made at this year's uh, spending review that have an impact on the earlier sector. Uh, three of the ones I'm going to focus on are additional funding for the early entitlement offers, um, business rates announcement, and new funding for family services. Get the next slide, please, Michael. I'm just trying to get my cursor across into the right screen. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Okay. So uh, one of the positives from this year's spending review was the announcement of additional funding for the early entitlement offers. So that's the two-year-old offer as well as the three and four-year-old offer. And it was a really bizarre announcement for, because what the Treasury announced was that the sector would get an additional 170 million by 2024-25. So we thought, is that spread over three years or does the sector have to wait until 24-25 to get it? And then they subsequently said, oh, no, we forgot to say there's also an 160 million in 22-23 and 180 million in 23-24. So it was, it was a really bizarre announcement, but basically the sector is getting roughly 170 million ish additional funding for the early entitlement offers each year over the next three years. So the financial years start in April and run through to the following May. So the 160 million will be in 2022. And I should preface this by saying that I will go on in a subsequent slides to talk about kind of what this means in practice, because I'm mindful that big numbers don't really mean anything. For, the, for those of you who've been with us before in previous seminars, webinars, when um, I've had Shannon, the pleasure of Shannon talking these things through, I've never stumped with a question. I'm going to try again. What is the logic between 23, 24 having 180 million and 24, 25 going back down to 170 million? Demographic bulge? Or? I haven't a clue, Michael. It's right. the strangest thing. And the idea that given that you know and i'll talk about this a bit more what lash living wage going up and other costs increasing that it doesn't increase gradually is lost on me it feels like it's dfe treasury negotiations and they've squeezed right. what they could out of each year depending on what other departments might have been getting that year but that's a total guess we were completely stumped by the rationale right. behind it when it was okay. announced great thank you um, so this follows additional funding that the sector received in recent years. So in 2020, we had an extra 66 million. And in 2021, so earlier this year, we received an extra 44 million. And I'll go on to it in subsequent slides, but when we're trying to work out what it might mean in practice for providers, we've kind of used what's happened in recent years and said, okay, if that's what happened last year and providers got X amount more, maybe next year, they'll get this much more. And um, see if I could get the next slide, please. So I've chosen 10 uh, local authorities because that's all I could fit on the slide. Uh, I, did, I, it, I did try to fit everybody in and realize that you need a magnifying glass, but it's just to talk about the funding increases over the last two years and what they translated to in terms of funding. Now, I know whenever we put up funding rates and kind of resources, we always get people saying that is not what I receive. So I hasten to add, this is what local authorities receive. So if you don't recognize the number as to your previous funding rates, it's because it's what goes to local authorities. And I will talk later about how that translates into um, rates for providers. So in 2020, the extra 66 million that the government gave to increase funding rates resulted in an extra 8p for two-year-old funding across the majority of local authorities and 8p for three-year-old funding. So if you look at Barking and Dag Dagenham, they went from £5.66 to £5.74 for their two-year-olds and £5.50 to £5.58. And then this year, we've got an extra 44 million across the sector and that resulted in an extra 8p for two-year-old funding across most local authorities and 6p for three and four-year-old funding. So again, if you look at Barking and Dagenham, £5.74 to £5.82 two-year-olds and £5.58 to £5.64. The reason I keep saying most and making the, the point to say most is if you have a look at Camden's three-year-old funding, 
you might, and if you're a Camden provider, you might have spotted it straight away that it's eight pound fifty one, eight pound fifty one, eight pound fifty one, and they have not received that increase. And the reason for that is when the earliest national funding formula was introduced in 2017, so that's the formula that dictates how much funding each local authority gets. Some, and particularly London authorities, when the, you kind of crunch what number the formula says they should get, it was actually a lot less than they were already getting. So the government put in what's called a loss cap, which is to say, okay, if you are getting paid a lot more than the funding formula says you should get, you can't have a drop of more than 10%. So what it means is in the government's eyes, these local authorities are already getting quite a bit more than they should be. So when the increases are happening, the government's saying, well, under the formula, they should be getting, I think in Camden, it's like £7.6. So they're getting £8.51. So they don't need an increase because they're already getting essentially kind of overfunded. I case and to add that, I'm sure there might be some Camden providers at, at the webinar that disagree I'm, with that. But this I, is, I'm, I'm just waiting for the chat yeah. to come. <laughs> before the chat starts to go mad. But this is just to explain the rationale. So if you're in a local authority that doesn't see an increase in funding, or you know, you're in the local authority over the last few years that hasn't, and you haven't seen your funding increase, it may well be because they haven't seen their funding increase because of the funding formula. So, so what is that? government recognized cutoff point then and um, we, we, you've got Camden there as an example what what yeah. is the figure it's a 10 percent drop from whatever they were getting before the early years national funding okay. formula came in what, there is also right. a separate funding floor which was four pound 34 and I think it's now like four sorry four pound 34 I think it's now four pound 48 or similar but this isn't the kind of funding floor this is you can't have a massive drop in funding right. okay. so it's a 10 percent loss cap is what it's called right do you want me to move on? Next slide, please. Thank you. So what we normally get is um, you get the local authority funding rates. And normally last year they were published in, I think it was 17th of December. So in December, each local authority should know what their hourly rate is going to be as of next April. But then, of course, you get the question, OK, that's great. That's what the local authority is getting. You know, what do I get? So under the early years national formula, local authorities have to pass on at least 95% of the funding they receive from central government to front run providers for the three and four year old offer. There is something called a dip disapplication process where a uh, council can say, actually my central admin costs are so much that I need more than that left over 5% to kind of pay for them. But it's very rare. And I think over recent years, only kind of two or three have done that. There isn't actually a requirement to pass on 95% of two-year-old funding. There's no, there's no pass through requirement for two-year-old funding. But the government says that's because broadly, local authorities are passing on the vast majority. So that kind of cutoff isn't required as it is for three and four-year-old funding. Again, I see Michael Squint. I'm just repeating the guidance. I'm just <laughs> sharing the information. Um, uh, but it is, it, I should say, if there are instances where people are finding that their two-year-old is being held back, it's it, we'd be grateful to flag it up because it's something we could flag up to the government if that guidance needs updating because it is now several years old. So local authorities should find out by the end of this year how much money they're getting from this extra funding. They then have to consult on their local schools forums, that's representatives from schools in early years about how education funding is spent by normally by the end of February. They don't actually need to inform under government guidance providers of their rates for the coming year until the end of March. So as you can imagine, if the rates kick in at the start of April, being told at the end of March what you need to do in terms of budgeting is not at all helpful. And it's something we've continued to raise for, uh, to the government, but, but that's the guidance as it is. So um, it should be schools funding formula, uh, schools forums defining the local funding formula and then providers being told thereafter. Uh, next one, please, Michael. So I added this in because obviously you can't talk about funding increases without talking about cost increases to providers. And one of the announcements kind of before the spending review is one of those things that have been pre-briefed was a significant increase in the national living and minimum wage. One thing we tend to still get questions about about the national living wage is, is just to be clear, it's not the voluntary living wage. This is the basically the minimum wage for over 23s. It's just it's a bit of government branding. So we talk about the national living wage, we are talking about a statutory minimum. So uh, this year, the national living wage for people 23 and over, it used to be 25, it's come down to 23, is £8.91. 
as of April next year, it will jump hugely to £9.50. It's a really significant increase. And as you can see across the age groups and for apprentices, there are similarly uh, significant increases for uh, people aged 23 and over. It's about 6.6% 6 .6 increase. If I could get the next slide, Michael. So what we've done is looked at, well, hang on a second, that this is some, some quite big increases in living wage and minimum wages. How does that compare to funding? So if you look back at 2017, when that national earliest funding formula came in, by next April, the national living wage will have increased by 27% since 2017. Between 2017 and this year, 2021, early years funding has increased by 3%. It's hard to work out what average funding rates will be next year. If you look at the fact that 66 million equated to 8p on the two-year-old and the three-year-old offer, and that we're kind of getting about three times, a bit less than three times that amount this year, with a really crude sum, you could say, okay, we might get an extra, on average, 20 pence-ish an hour. That's a really, really crude estimate because we don't know how funding is going to be split between the two-year-old and the three-year-old offer and things like that. But if, say, on average, early years funding rates increase by 20 pence next April, that would still only mean that since 2017, early years funding rates would have increased by about 7% since 2017. So there's still nowhere near uh, keeping pace with the national living wage increases. And it's also worth noting that the government has uh, announced that it's going to be increasing national insurance contributions as of April for both employees and employers by 1.2%. And in 2023, that will then get branded the health and social care levy. So again, there's going to be a lot of additional costs for providers. And I will say, and, and Michael will know more about this than me, that Strong Early Years London and the Alliance in Working as part of the programme is producing some really fantastic tools to support early years providers to understand well okay I've got this many staff this many are on the living wage this are many on the national living wage here are how my costs are increasing this is how much my funding is increasing this is how much I predict my occupancy is going to increase and working out what that means in terms of a budget so I don't want to kind of just bring negativity to the presentation. <laughs> I know it's just awful and there's not enough money. Strong Early Years London is making some really fantastic tools to help providers kind of get ahead of the game and budget and really understand on a kind of granular level what these Thank you, Shannon. Um, when we get to the end of the slides, there is information about um, the next webinar early in December where we will, inter we will launch the, the budget tool that, that Shannon is referencing. Uh, and it, it, it is a fantastic um, piece of equipment that we can help work through with you to sort of ask some really pertinent questions about your provision. So I, um, I'll, I'll give, speak more about that in due course. Um, Vanessa said, I was interested to see that we're supposed to be told our funding rates by the end of March. You may already know this. In Hackney, we were told our funding rates were 21-22 in August 2021. That's not helpful, Vanessa. Really. I would ask, I don't know if my contact details are on this ticket, give me an email about that because there's government DFE guidance that says by the end of March. I cannot fathom how that worked in practice. Um, so if my email uh, address, I can maybe uh, pop it in the chat at we, the we, end. We'll get it into the chat. Or we'll, we'll email. Um, you'll get contact details from myself and Jonathan, um, who some of you may have met already um, at the end, and we'll get that through to Shannon. Thank you, Vanessa, for comment. It'll be interesting to know if that if that has purely hacked me, um, or if that was something which has happened in, in more boroughs. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so just a brief word on business rates. Um, so those of you that are run settings or working settings that are subject to rates will be aware that during the pandemic, uh, the government gave 100% business rate relief to providers for a short period of time, April to June. And then that fell to 66% relief, which lasts until the end of March. We had hoped that this would be extended at the spending review, but the government has given 50% relief for the next financial year to retail, hospitality and leisure businesses, and they have taken it away from earlier settings. So again, in terms of budgeting, for those settings that are subject to rates, it's another big, big... Were, were there any... Sorry, were there any other sectors that didn't get included into the new relief? That, or were, that were the it. only one? So it was, it was just retail, hospitality, 
leisure. So when the pandemic support was introduced, it was retail, hospitality and leisure. And then belatedly, the earlier sector was kind of added on. Um, we've had confirmation that there is no intention to add the um, earlier sector into this kind of extended relief. However, it did happen belatedly before. So there's no saying that if pressure isn't put on the government and evidence shown that, you know, the impact that it's going to have on those settings that are eligible, that they couldn't do a very quiet U-turn and just say, we're extending, we're extending the offer. Great. Um, thank you, Michael. Next one. And then just a quick word on the kind of broader early year support um, funding that was announced. Again, this was announced before the spending review, but it's spending measure. So a uh, Conservative MP called Andrea Ledson carried out the early years health development review, which looked at conception from um, conception to age two, the kind of first thousand and one days. And that got broad support across the kind of government. So there was 500 million in early support across 75 local authorities, which are yet to be announced and confirmed, uh, announced. So that included 82 million into kind of, uh, what's called family hubs, one-stop shops where families can go to access services they need. You know, some of us have traditionally called them children's centers, but they are family hubs under this government. Um, parenting programs, Start for Life offer, breastfeeding support, infant and perimental health, workforce pilots, that's about trying to help local authorities recruit more people that have the skills to support parents and things like mental health and breastfeeding to make up for difficulties in terms of health visitor numbers. Yep. And then the expanding supporting families program, which used to be called the Travel, Travels Families program to, to support um, families. So it's just a quick overview of that because uh, if any anybody here, um, works or crosses over into kind of broader early support it may be in the coming year that you find that there's more funding coming your way okay, great. thank you and then early years recovery so you may be aware that the government announced kind of during the pandemic about what used to be called a catch-up fund an education catch-up fund so uh, they've changed the language around this now and it's now called recovery but it's about supporting children who have missed out on learning during the pandemic uh, to, to recover from the kind of impact of that. So the funding for across the education sector has been kind of announced in tranches. To date, there's been about five billion pounds for uh, education recovery announced. 153 million of that is going to the early years. So that calculates to about 3%. Um, so as you can imagine, uh, we at the Alliance are uh, completely clear that there may, needs to be so much more uh, investment into the earlier sector. Uh, the DfE has recently confirmed which programmes uh, this has been, uh, this money is being spent on. So it's a lot of things to kind of upskill practitioners, to share best practice, to develop the three qualifications, increase the number of SENCOs, support training uh, to support parents in home learning. And I think our view is that these are all very positive initiatives, but it feels like it's initiatives that the government probably should have been investing in anyway. And it's not really clear if you're talking about um, specific support to support children recover from the impact of the pandemic, that that was the focus when they were putting this program together, as opposed to just plugging some training gaps that they should have been plugging anyway. So, and our view has also been that we don't really recall the sector being um, consulted on what was best for this recovery funding. Uh, so I think there's probably a lot more to be done and discussions of the DfE are ongoing. There have been several announcements about recovery funding, you know, where more gets committed. So there's nothing to say that this is the last of it, but this is how it is as it stands. Great, thank you. And I think this is my last slide. Uh, so this is the national professional qualifications. So the, the DfE announced recently a suite of national professional qualifications uh, in education, including one in early years leadership. And we posted about it on our social media. We had this wave of excitement. And what, what is this? Is this like another level six? Is it EYP equivalent, EYT equivalent, QTS equivalent? So we went back to the DfE and said, do you have any more um, information on this qualification? There's real excitement in the sector. And we were told it's not a qualification, um, despite being called a national professional qualification. It's high quality training uh, offer to support career progression. Um, so for those uh, settings who are, um, or practitioners and early educators who are interested in leadership roles, so that can be in nurseries, preschools, or a leadership role in a child minding setting. Um, this is a, a qualification or um, 
professional development to support you to develop those leadership skills. The government has confirmed that assuming the applicant meets the uh, eligibility criteria, which is yet to be published, it will be fully funded. So it's not at a cost to the setting or the individual. They have published some information on the learning aims of the MPQ, which is in a link that when you get the, the slides, you should be able to click. And they have told us that they're expecting to publish further information this month about when it's going to be rolled out, when people can apply the application process. But I know a lot of people that queried us about this, I think thought it was a kind of qualification that might um, have some kind of equivalence to kind of EYP, EYT, because it's called the early years leadership qualification. So it's just to clarify, it's professional development, but the, the DfE have told us it's, it's not a qualification. Hmm. Is there anything I can say there? Because I had, I remember when we were having the conversation in terms of well, what level is it? I mean, when we had the MPQ ICL, um, that was level seven, I think, and there was also that issue about QTS, etc. So, for it to be qualification that isn't is um is really quite interesting. Thank you, um, stunning as ever, Shannon. Thank you. Please don't go away, um, because that was all the good news. <laughs> now we leave it to, to Melanie to take us on uh, through consideration of what's been happening with Ofsted. Uh, Melanie, let's hope the microphone is there. How are you? Hello, thank you, Michael. And thank you, Shannon. I, I always hate to follow Shannon's session because you're so precise and, and you get the information across so very well. So uh, no challenge for me there. Um, yeah, I'm so glad that I'm not talking about funding and budgets, and, and I'm quite happy that I'm going to talk to you about Ofsted and practice generally. And I started this slide by thinking Ofsted, what's new? And then I thought, actually, we're in November now, so this isn't necessarily new. It's recent, but I still feel that we need to flag these things up. And as, as I go through the next couple of slides, um, I'll also be talking about some of the emerging trends as well from the Ofsted inspection reports that have been published for inspections that have been done since uh, the new EYFS came into force. So starting with the updated early years inspection handbook. Now, the 2019 handbook was updated and, and I've always said that it preempted some of the changes to the EYFS that have since come in, particularly with the emphasis on curriculum. And we were introduced to things like intent, implementation and impact. Um, and we were all trying to get our heads around what an early years curriculum actually meant and what it looked like. So in readiness for the revised um, EYFS in September, the handbook was updated again. And if I remember rightly, it was early August when we saw an updated version. It might have been slightly earlier than that. But then on the 1st of September, Ofsted released another updated early years inspection handbook. And there were just a few things in this latest version that were clarified. So, I suppose before I go on, I'd just say, make sure that you've got the most recent version of the Early Years Inspection Handbook, um, because as we always say, and, and I know Michael says this himself, that Ofsted, they may set the test when they come out to inspect, but they give us all the answers in the handbook. So really being familiar with the handbook is so important. It's certainly something I refer to time and time again. So let's just have a quick look then at some of the things that have been updated. So Ofsted have now clarified um, how they will uh, view or not view a provider's internal progress and assessment data when they inspect. So it, this doesn't mean that providers can't use data or can't collect data where they consider it to be appropriate to do so. So things like tracking children's progress um, and, and assessment data, Ofsted don't particularly want to see that. And they've been saying this to us for a while now, and they've clarified this again in the handbook. And what they do say, and I'm just reading directly from what Ofsted say here, Ofsted want to focus, the inspectors want to focus on curriculum and less on generation analysis and interpretation of data. So where you are collecting data, they will want to know what you're doing with it, how you're using that data, but they do not want to sit and read it. They are much more interested in what's happening 
what you're doing with your time and how you're using your time directly to actually teach and support the children that you're working with. <clears throat> Excuse me. And they've also clarified um, the exemptions from the learning and development requirements of the EYFS and how this will be looked on during inspection. Now, as we know, some providers uh, can apply to be exempt from some or all aspects of the learning and development requirements. The exemptions can either modify or fully exempt providers. So during inspection, Ofsted will want to see the paperwork that's associated with that, uh, which includes confirmation from the DfE that, that you're actually allowed to actually make those exemptions or allowed to be exempt from the learning and development requirements from the EYFS. And then finally, uh, just a little more clarification on providers who may be offering a specialist early years curriculum. Now, Ofsted have said many, many times that how you deliver the EYFS, your curriculum, your pedagogy is up to you. And Ofsted do not impose a curriculum or impose a pedagogy on an early years setting. And they recognize your autonomy to provide a specialist early years curriculum if that's what you do. And this may be because you follow a specific philosophical or pedagogical approach or reflect a particular faith in your setting. So the method of teaching is down to you as long as it falls within the confines of the EYFS. Okay. I haven't. Yes, I haven't seen a report which specifically reference. Do, do they say in the report this setting follows this specialist curriculum in in whatever way? Is it an explicit point in the report when they publish? I haven't seen one. Um, I haven't seen one, but my understanding from reading the guidance is that they would reference right. that. Yes, as part okay. of the report. Right. Thank you. So not much has changed then recently, but like I said, it's really important, I believe, to, to have that current um, inspection handbook. And on top of that, uh, Ofsted also updated inspecting safeguarding in early years settings. That handbook was updated recently as well. And the changes in the handbook were really to keep it in line with keeping children safe in education, which is the non statutory guidance that early years settings are advised that they may find useful. And I would urge anybody to actually, uh, again, download both documents there and just go through it and have a look at what that actually means to you. Now, most of the changes in KC, KCSIE, as we call it for short, um, are actually around some of the um, sexual harassment in schools and some of the upskirting and some of those issues that most of you will have seen in the media that Ofsted actually were doing quite um, a lot of work on looking at some of the issues that were coming up in schools with regard to sexual harassment and so on. So most of the changes that they've made in the KCSIE document are around those, um, those issues. Okay, Michael, if we can just move on again. <clears throat> are we there? Can you see that, Melanie? I know you've got a bit of a delay. No, it hasn't moved yet. Oh, yes, has it has. It? I do apologise. I was a bit early. I do apologise. You, you were, were I wasn't you? rushing you, or anyway, just I had a phone call yeah. coming. I was a bit distracted, sorry. Oh. Good grief. Okay. We are there. Emerging trends. Melanie, Emerging trends. I'm with you. I'm with you. So we um, what we know uh, that one of the things that's appeared most frequently as reasons for settings being downgraded, so receiving that lower inspection grade than their previous grade, between certainly between May and September, some analysis was undertaken by early years fundamentals, as is up on the slide there. And the number one thing that came up uh, with regard to settings being downgraded was around curriculum knowledge and delivery. Um, and I think safeguarding, which we would always expect to be further up the list, was actually down in number seven, I believe. I'm it right. It was pretty saying. low down. Although having yes. said that, I remember having a conversation with colleagues at, at London Borough of Bromley and they had had a number uh, of downgrades on safeguarding. So I think that might be, um, the, the, it might mask individual circumstances. Yes, yeah, indeed. And so that trend appears to be continuing in, in some of the recently published reports that I've looked at. Now, what I will say as a disclaimer here is my 
research is not as scientific or as rigorous. Um, but what I have done is I've looked at the recent Ofsted reports, so any that have been published since the new EYFS came into force. And these are some of the things that I picked up on. And certainly curriculum knowledge and delivery is coming up again and again. And there are statements around uh, staff not being fully aware of what the approach to the curriculum is, that the curriculum isn't consistent across all ages in the setting. And another one that seemed to have come up an awful lot as well is around the planning and the sequencing of the curriculum as well. And that, again, I just got to reiterate, is not about paperwork. That's about practitioners' knowledge, um, educators' knowledge of their intent, their implementation, and the impact of the curriculum. So just be very aware of that. And in a moment, we're going um, just to one other thing, just to mm -hmm. talk about the resources and support that's available through this program. Um, it's quite rightly recognised that a good Ofsted inspection outcome is an essential part of business management in this situation. So we are in a position to, and we have delivered webinars and business connect sessions on um, supporting uh, settings to prepare for their next inspection. And we are through the consultancy arrangements as well in a position to try and help that as well. So again, when I talk mm -hmm. at the end, just giving you some details about the consultancy arrangements, you might, might want to think about offset opportunities and preparation as something which is pertinent to your provision. Thank you, Mama. Absolutely. OK, so one of the things that's also come up over and over again in, in the, the most recent reports, in the newest reports, which is something that I think we can all give ourselves a real pat on the back for, is that the sector has been proactive and has worked really hard to deliver services effectively throughout the pandemic. And we know that, of course we do, but it is so nice to see this actually being reflected in what Ofsted is saying during their, their inspection visits. And, and as we know, it is part of the inspection criteria that they will actually talk to staff about how they've coped, what the challenges have been, how they've ensured that children haven't fallen behind in their learning and development, and of course how they've responded to children that were maybe vulnerable prior to the lockdown and who, you know, whose uh, circumstances may well have deteriorated through the circumstances of the pandemic. So really good to see comments such as this um, that I put up on the screen that staff have adapted well to the challenges of COVID and continue to place a high priority on everyone's health and that parents have really appreciated the contact. And, and we know how very innovative uh, providers have had to be, you know, through lockdown and beyond to actually maintain those uh, relationships with parents and, you know, looking forward and everybody is looking forward now to how they actually continue to build on some of the things that work really well um, through, through lockdown that actually now they want to incorporate into practice, certainly in the way that we engage with parents. We've all had to be really creative on that one. And, and just one comment on that. I think there's, there is also the issue, don't, don't be afraid to articulate your curriculum through the prism of our children have been very poorly affected by COVID. And so we are focusing particularly on their social and emotional development and recovery, speech and language. That is a, a wholly legitimate curriculum which responds to the, child, the cohort of children's needs you've got. And, if, and so back, it's back to Mel's, Melanie's first point in terms of being able to articulate that across your staff team to the offset inspector. Absolutely. And in fact, in Ofsted's annual report, Amanda Spielman did say that one of the things that they would expect to be seeing would be that there was a focus on PSED. Um, so, you know, so yes, don't be afraid to articulate that as well. And if you also saw the research today, I can't remember, Shannon will probably know this, who published the reports today, it was on one of the updates in terms of the reduction in physical activity that children um, suffered from uh, up to about 60 percent, I think, or how few of them were actually getting the recommended amount of daily activity. Again, that's an essential part of the, the recovery process that provision can actually respond to now. And, and that is an absolute priority um, and it's passion of mine because um, I've seen firsthand actually the impact of, of the, the, the lack of physical activity and how particularly children's gross motor skills are being affected. But I won't go off on that one. No, 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 no. That's a whole different <laughs> webinar. That's a whole different web webinar. OK, but now there's always a but, isn't there, with these slides? And, and I just wanted to flag this up because th this is something that we are seeing and we're hearing about. 
where the committee has perhaps changed or perhaps a, a committee run group has lost contact with members of the committee you know we've all been dealing with our own challenges you know if the committee is not fulfilling their responsibilities then this will always be a limiting judgment this is always likely to land you in requires improvement or inadequate uh, and this is just one example of a few that i actually found the committee has not provided new managers with support during the pandemic to help them fulfill their roles and responsibilities effectively and again i know through through the work that we're actually doing through strong early years London we're actually supporting committees as well and I'm sure Michael would would talk more there about. is a session on Saturday and again more details at the end of today's slide there we go there we go it's okay. seamless isn't it really? absolutely it's like having an ad break after every bullet <laughs> point isn't it <laughs> brilliant now a word from our sponsors <laughs> and so yeah so just be very aware of that that your committee has responsibilities you know if you're worried about your committee at the moment then there we go let's let's listen out at the end of the slide to find out what we can do about that so um what i've also heard and i have heard this directly from the horse's mouth that there has been a trend of more requires improvements cropping up in these post uh, september inspections that are happening now we can actually equate that directly back to the fact that Ofsted are still catching up and they are still prioritizing the settings that they have been most concerned about and they always said this as they returned to their full inspection activity that they would be prioritizing they'd be risk assessing and they would be prioritizing the settings they were most concerned about so I suppose you can say naturally that that's going to result in in some more requires improvement judgments so things will start to balance out I hope um, so I spend an awful lot of time on this website web watchstead now I just mentioned to you how I'd done my own research and if any of you have ever heard of watchstead before you will know how very engaging it is and how very useful it is if you haven't I would urge you to have a look on on watchstead you can put in a keyword so for example cultural capital what are Ofsted saying about it in their inspection reports what do you need to be thinking about if we go on to the next slide obviously you can put all your search criteria in there and what these uh, Watchstead will do well they'll bring up the main findings in the most recent Ofsted inspections so for example it's very small writing but I'll try and read out a couple of them uh, with regard to cultural capital you can see it's highlighted there meaningful curriculum ensures children have a range of opportunities that support their cultural capital and you can see that this is a setting that's outstanding across the board so you can actually um, refine your search criteria you could look for cultural cultural capital in settings that have been judged inadequate or requires improvement and you can just refine it and, and whatever it is that you're interested in so if you're looking at PSED for example search criteria and you can see what's going on and what Ofsted are saying in their reports um I will I, I always whenever we I'm a big fan of watchstead.com. Yes. It's developed by a company called Angel Solutions. There, there is a saleable version, which the, the target audience is usually local authorities, but this is the free version. This is the light version that's free. And what's interesting, not only can you put the keyword search in, you can do analysis by local authority. Um, you can get analysis by dates. And fantastically, um, Shannon and I always used to have to wait for quarterly updates from Ofsted yes. to get information about what had happened previously. Watchstead.com does it twice a day. It trawls um, the latest reports on, on Ofsted's website and just brings it into its database. It, it's a superb piece of kit. You can have some real fun with it. And, and there you go, Shannon and Michael, very much on the data side of things, whereas I tend to go straight in for the practice and what's going on <laughs> uh, with regard to the teaching and learning. So um, I'm just going to finish off quickly then just by flagging up something else that's recent. Ofsted does carry out a lot of research um, and that research that they do helps to inform their inspection activity and helps to inform their future plans. And the most recent research that's come out, which I've started to read through and I'm actually finding it quite fascinating, is the um the research they've done into early years multiple providers so I, I assume what we would call nursery chains if you like yeah. 
and um, they're actually looking at how these multiple providers influence the education and care given at their nurseries. And I'm not sure, of course, if any of you are multiple providers out there, but if you are, I'd really urge you to have a look at this research. And they just started to dig a bit deeper into how these multiple providers set the curriculum across all of their provision, how they control policies and procedures, what regular visits to nurseries and so on look like, and, and actually all, also starting to think how this might influence Ofsted's inspection activity in the future and whether they actually inspect those multiple providers in a different way as well. But um, the reports there do have a look at it. It's, it is really interesting. Shannon, and if, if I'm right, isn't there a survey going on or consultation in terms of how this um, will be taken forward in the future? I remember seeing something. I can't mm. quite remember the detail. I think it's all linked to the report that Mel's referring to. It's all part of this work and it's something that the officer has been looking at for quite a while actually in terms of how they inspect multiple providers or nursery trains as you say Mel so it's all part of a, a larger piece of work that's ongoing that's right. Thank you. Oh wow I am there Melanie. I think you've been playing with the animation buttons Melanie haven't you really? That's I have great. not. <laughs> it, it, it leapt out of my screen there. Um, thank you both as ever an excellent roundup um, and it's just back to me to do the um, the advertising really just by way as I mentioned before um, we will circulate these slides and, and the blue highlighted um, underlined um, sections there are our upcoming events. The one I mentioned earlier on is the launch, uh, the next webinar is the launch of the, the budgeting tool um, and the support that we can offer through the program. But also, um, as I mentioned earlier on, seamlessly, tomorrow we are doing a session and I'm involved in, in terms of the, the benefits of apprentices for your business. Um, and also on Saturday, linking to what Melanie was talking about, um, key elements of attracting new committee members, effective handover and the role of committee members as well. Uh, we're then back to business health checks, exploring other income streams uh, and key elements of effective budgeting. It's a, it's a very comprehensive program, all free. I should always forget to say this, all free um, un, uh, under the commission program. Uh, and so uh, we would welcome you to sign up when you get the slides or through the website uh, that's mentioned earlier on, or basically, uh, oh, I should have said this before, there is also the wider business support that is available to the early years sector as small, medium-sized enterprises, mostly um, is what we are talking about here. And there is uh, ERDF funded uh, provision available through the London Business Hub as well. So that's not part of this project, but is available up to 12 hours of de dedicated individual support um, from London Business Hub experts. Um, and also uh, the business advisors, the link is there so you can find out further information as well. Um, and it, it, I would encourage people to visit the London Business Hub website to just play around and see what support is available because it's, uh, but that's a reference to us as a, the size of our industry rather than actually the specific information that our industry covers. Um, hopefully um, you've seen that from today's sessions, we can offer a broad range of support to you as you go forward. If you'd like any further information about the project itself or to have further discussions about how we can help you with one-to-one -one support, um, the two key email addresses are mine and my colleague, Jonathan Lucas. Um, but you'll, again, those will be on the, on the screen when you get them at the end. Uh, and while I've just been walking on there, I'm just waiting a couple of seconds to see if there are any other questions, conscious that we've taken 50 minutes of your evening already. Um, it doesn't look like anything's coming in. Um, and for those of you who've been with us in the past, we don't artificially extend these things. Um, so it just remains for me to say thank you to my colleagues and experts, um, Shannon and Melanie, for another first rate um, presentation of where the sector is and what we're facing. Um, and my, it's a pleasure to, um, to thank all of the, those of you who have been with us today um, and to in, make, in, ugh, I'm losing the word, I can't get my feet out. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening and will join us again for strong early years London settings in due course. We're getting some Melanie from Monica, that's very kind of you. Um, this will be available, the recording will be available hopefully from about Friday on uh, via the website and onto the Alliance YouTube page. Um, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you very much. Take care, everybody. Bye bye.